Cool. Right, this is going to come across as a slightly odd question, but it will become very apparent very quickly why I'm asking this. If there is anyone whose first language is not English, could you sit in the front row, and if I start to speak at the speed of light, just heckle me loudly, please? I really need this. I do talk far too fast, far too quickly. Cool, what's time? I expect that makes no sense to anyone. Oh yes, you are still getting victimised. And if you're especially tall as well, you're probably going to get victimised as well. Let me know when you're happy for me to start. Cool, awesome. Hang on, so let me just have a quick drink. Awesome, cool. Awesome, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for coming, everyone. Um, I will point out that up until about two hours ago, I wasn't going to do this today. Um, so if there's anything wrong with this, I apologise completely. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about uh, type 2 fuzzy logic, which is essentially fuzzy, fuzzy logic. Um, so is anyone here who's ever used fuzzy logic before in either electronics, engineering, or for things like searching, that sort of thing? That's great. So I'm guessing you've used uh, type 1 or in anything. Uh, if you haven't used type 2, you probably don't know it's called type 1, so that was a stupid question. So what you guys used uh, type, uh, what you guys used fuzzy logic for? AI. AI, brilliant, cool. So that's kind of the one of the main fundamental uses of it as I cover. Um, but okay, so this should be quite interesting for you because I'm going to tell you that everything you've been doing is wrong, basically. Um, cool. All right, so uh, just a quick note. Um, there will be audience participation in this, and I really love audience participation. Um, as I said, if I start to speak too fast, please just, I don't know, let's have a symbol. Thumb up it means I'm talking too fast. Uh, I won't point out that you've said it, I'll just try and slow down. Um, if there's any questions at any point, just stick a hand up and I'll try and answer them. Um, and I will be getting some people up on stage to kind of demonstrate some principles, and I will ask some stupid questions. Um, so hopefully that's all okay. Um, so kind of start off just to why you should listen to me when I talk about type 2 fuzzy logic. Because um, I know this guy, I'm not this guy, but I do know this guy. Um, this is Professor Bob John, he's currently at the University of Nottingham, he was previously uh, another university, um, and he's written a paper called Type 2 Fuzzy Logic Made Simple, um, which is arguably a very bad title, because that paper makes no sense. Um, but it has over a thousand citations now, um, basically it's a big deal, uh, he's really kind of unified the field, um, and I've just done a uh, thesis under him uh, on the same topic with his supervision, so I, hopefully I know somewhat what I'm on about. Um, also I'm on computer file talking about fuzzy logic. They did this to me, I don't know why. Um, so if there's any questions remaining after, uh, come and talk to me, I'll give you the link to this video and hopefully it'll clear some things up. Um, so I'm going to try and present it much more fun and kind of informally. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I didn't, wasn't paying attention. Uh, much more fun and informally to how it's normally presented. So this is actually a page from Type 2 Fuzzy Logic Made Simple. Um, it's a great paper. It does explain a lot if you understand what this means, um, which when I first started Fuzzy Logic, I didn't understand what that means. Um, so there's going to be a lot of very big images, um, like this one. So to talk about Fuzzy Logic, we first need to talk about crisp logic or Boolean logic. Um, so all of you probably know what this is. This is true and false, uh, zeros and ones. So for example, uh, the bits in the computer, they can only be one or zero, right? Uh, everyone gets this. Um, but there's certain things that don't quite work with this, uh, and you may not even realize it. So. Let's try and give one. Can someone give me an example of something which can be classified by true and false? Anyone at all? So it's really windy up here. What's sorry? Dead or alive. See, that's very fuzzy in itself because you've got different types of dead and alive, right? You could be very ill, then you're arguably closer to being dead than other people. So that's something that could be very fuzzy. So it's like these sort of things and Humanity is inherently uncertain, they're inherently vague. We don't have a clue what we're talking about half the time. Half of our language means different things to different people. So as a prime example of this, oh, wrong slide. <laughs> That's a slide later. Um, so someone called Lot Fizade kind of realized this around 1975 um, when he re uh, introduced something called fuzzy set theory. Um, and basically what fuzzy set theory seeks to do is to allow us to classify and talk about the uncertainties that are inherent in human language um, and uh, vagueness and how to deal with uh, uncertainties in data and how to deal with uncertainties in the way we model things. Um, and he completely revolutionized the field. This, you might be able to see there, he's actually sitting next to a rather large trophy. This is one of many awards he's won of his lifetime for his work in this field and other things, um, particularly artificial intelligence. Um, so going back to crisp sets and Boolean logic, this is what you may be used to. So a Venn diagram is a typical example of a set. We have a set A and B. If we're talking uh, 
true and false, something may be true in set A or may be false in set B, and then we have the union of these sets. So this could be, I don't know, uh, if you're in my talk or in EMF. So you might be in my talk. Uh, it makes no sense because you can't be in my talk and not in EMF unless you've got a day ticket. Uh, you know how sets work. <laughs> cool. So let's talk about the weather. Weather's cool. So weather is a really good example of how bad the human language is and how uncertain, how vague it is. Um, so if I were to look outside and describe the weather right now, I'd probably say it's looking pretty nasty and this wind is really distracting. Uh, but pretty nasty or not very nice or nice or sunny, these don't really mean a lot. They're not temperature. They're not wind speed. They're not... The computers can't act on this information. Um, so we need a way of dealing with this. And essentially what fuzzy sets and fuzzy logic tries to do. So... When you start getting things like this, they get fuzzy to a point where you can't tell what they are, and computers can't use that information. Um, so we have this idea of mem membership. Um, so with membership, in crisp sets, the sets you're used to, Boolean sets, you have zeros and ones. What we do in fuzzy sets is widen that interval to all the values between zero and one. So for example, if you're dealing with a uh, height, uh, you might have someone who, for example, me, I'm about 5'8", so I'm not exactly tall, but I'm not exactly short. So I might be 0 0.65 tall, for example. Uh, and it's, at this point, you need to be very careful, because that sounds somewhat like probability. Uh, it's a completely different concept. This measures vagueness, whereas prob probability measures likelihood. Um, so we build sets out of this information instead. But then you need a way of classifying that. You need a way of saying that. Take a value and then give us a membership function. So that thing at the beginning that said the, uh, truth, the degree of truth of indicating the membership of this talk to awesome is solid one, basically meant that there is a fuzzy set, one, you put a you give a talk in, and it gives how true the set is to be in one, uh, to be in awesome. My talk's definitely in awesome. Um, so to do that, we need membership functions. So these have different shapes. Here's one of them. This is a triangle membership function. Thank you. <laughs> this is a, a triangle membership function. Um, so basically what this does is we we'll take in an uh, input value, which is the x-axis, and out you'd get a value that's on the y-axis, a membership. So this could be anything. This could be height, so I could put in, oh no, it can't be height because it comes down. This could be temperature. So I could put in a temp, this could be the fuzzy set of comfortable. So the set itself is actually represented by the function. Um, you don't need anything else to represent the set. You don't need the input values. You just need to know the domain they come from. So if we're dealing with, uh, if, it, if we're dealing with temperature, if I'm saying that this represents how comfortable a temperature is, I don't need to know all the possible values I'm going to enter. I just need to know that I'm dealing with temperatures. Um, so I could put a temperature in, uh, find that, for example, if I put in maybe some temperature along this range, it will come out about 0 0.6. Um, and you can use these to build increasingly complex systems. So here we've got multiple ones. So you can actually, the interesting thing about fuzzy sets as opposed to uh, Boolean sets is you can have di uh, differing membership values in differing sets. So this is looking at uh, amount of gray levels in light. Um, so we can have dark, gray, and bright. You can see very clearly that we can have overlapping ones here. So we can actually classify the amount of different substances in different sets. Um, so you might ask where this is useful. Uh, this has actually been incredibly widely used in industry since about the 80s. Um, so the main, the main example is if you own a washing machine, it uses fuzzy logic an awful lot. Uh, so there's a lot of fuzziness in the washing machine. For example, uh, the dirtiness of the water, how warm the water is as it comes through, and all this sort of thing, how fast it should spin. It needs to know how fast it should spin, whether it should flush more hot water through, all of these things. And it has to take a lot of very imprecise measurements from uh, how the wash is going to do that. So we start to build fuzzy systems that act on that. So to actually make a fuzzy system, a system that can take some values use a fuzzy set, use a fuzzy membership function, and give you a result, we have to have rules. And that's when you start to get slightly complicated looking things like this. Um, so basically what this is doing is, uh, this has got a collection of fuzzy membership functions um, arranged in a rule-like format. So we have if, then rules. And on the left, the antecedent, that's the bit after the if, uh, the bit that you, the Boolean section, um, you measure how much something belongs to a membership set. So you could say, for example, uh, if person is tall, then do an action. But the thing that will come out of doing that, the thing that will come out of applying person to tall will be a membership value. So it'd be 0 0.65, for example. Um, and then with that, you apply a minimum function to the uh, consequent, which is the thing on the right near the then. So if it's in the washing machine, you would take water temperature, say, is water warm? then action. So the action, if it's warm, may be not to increase temperature. If it's cold, it may be to increase the temperature. Um, so once you've done that, you then get a set out of the rules. And with that rule, 
you can then come out to a results set. So we're going to demonstrate this, uh, these ideas and kind of why this makes sense uh, by victimizing my friends who unfortunately come along today. Thank you very much, guys. So can I have you guys up on stage? And another tall gentleman. You're drinking a beer, so I won't do you. Uh, anyone who's tall? Uh, let's have Dan. Yay, I'm glad you came. Thanks, Christian. I didn't see him there. Cool. So if you want to arrange yourself in high order, I'm sure you know how high you are. Sam, what are you doing? Uh, come on, man. All right, we'll leave you alone. This isn't going to work very well with only three of them, but that would do. Cool. Dan, come at this end. <laughs> it's fine, Sam, don't worry. Cool. Right. So, kind of as a recap of things we've gone, let's first try and classify these people uh, strictly in Boolean sets. So, we're going to deal with a linguistic variable. That is a word that we use in English that may mean something. So, let's deal with height. Height is a linguistic variable. We need to assign some value to this. So, we have linguistic values. These could be tall, short, these sort of things. But those things don't really mean anything. So, if we want to do that now with Boolean logic, we'd have to decide a crisp cutoff point where some of these people were tall or short. And that doesn't necessarily make sense. For example, if we take Sid and Sam, we may arbitrarily decide that, cut in half, Sam is tall and Sid is short. But there's probably a centimetre difference between them. That's just madness. There shouldn't be such a clear cutoff. It might make, sorry, thank you. It might make slightly more sense between Sam and Simon. But again, if someone is perhaps a centimetre shorter than Simon, they would be classified as tall, while on the other side, they're classified as short. Just absolute nonsense. So. We're going to do it with a membership function instead. If we just imagine that uh, Sid is probably 160 centimetres. I don't actually know how tall people are in centimetres. Let's just go with it. 160 and Dan is 220. Seven <laughs> foot? Um, <laughs> metric imperial. I'm English. Um, let's go with that. Okay, so we have to now construct a membership function for it. And this is where we run into our first problem. So, let's have someone from... This is scary. Let's have someone suggesting for the audience. So, if you were going to decide, so say we had a, tra uh, a trapezium. So, you've got a point where it's at zero, and a point where it goes up to one, and then it stays at one, and then it comes down. If you were to decide where the first point would be, where someone would first start becoming, let's say, tall, which kind of, let's go even feet, I want those feet. Where would you set that? Where would you decide that, for example, in, out of these four, where would you decide that there was tallness? Anyone tall? Anyone want to choose something? Go on. Okay, cool. So we'll put our first point in between Sam and Simon. So at this point, we've got a membership function, it takes in their height, and then it's setting uh, that in between Sam and Simon, it will raise up to one. So if Sam is 160 and Simon's 180, we'll start to get increasing membership values. So Sam will be zero on tool, and then 165 will be 0 0.2, 167 will be 0 0.3, etc., until it gets up to one. But the problem here is what makes you an expert in that field? Why do you know how to do that? It is complete and utter hypocrisy. Woo. Cool. Um, okay, okay, you guys can sit down. <laughs> Sorry, I just needed a visual example. Thank you. <laughs> right. And this is kind of the. Oh, wait, let me get away. Um, this is kind of the main thing that Lot Fisardi realised again, uh, and he realised this very, very quickly in actually 1978. Um, the problem with membership functions. So what we're saying with uh, type one fuzzy sets is that you have. Uh, uncertainty and we have vagueness and we need a way of dealing with that. So we make a membership function that assigns truth values. But the person who constructs that membership function, why does he know any better? That membership function is still crisp. Once we've defined it, it can't be redefined. You give it a value and a crisp membership a crisp truth value still comes out. So what we in fact need is fuzzy fuzzy sets. We need sets that take a value and then have uh, the truth values, but each one of those truth values then has a truth value indicating how true that value could be. This is madness. It's really cool, it's really helpful, and it's much more accurate, um, but it's very hard to represent. So here is one way of representing it. So this area shaded in green is a footprint of uncertainty, um, which basically means this is the area on our uh, function where there is now another membership function coming out of it. So essentially what you have is a x value, uh, an x axis, which is your input data, a uh, y axis, which is your truth values, and then out of that comes another axis, which is in fact a type one fuzzy set, the fuzzy sets I've been talking about, uh, between different truth values. Um, and this is this looks very nice, it looks like it deals with the problem, uh, but then, I mean, straight away there's some issues, like how would we actually draw a graph to get some data from this? There are unfortunately many ways of representing them, even to the point now where people are starting to cut these up into layers. Um, and none of them really solve the problem because it's very, very complex and we can't really deal with it. And then we have additional problems in that. We start to think then, okay, so 
if we're saying that we can't trust people to make the membership functions, and once the membership functions are made, they themselves are certain, so it's no longer fuzzy, we need to make a new membership function for that membership function. But then the new one is now crisply defined and is no longer fuzzy, so we need to go further, and then you get type 3 fuzzy logic. And the, type, the computation requirements for type 2 are already huge, so type 3 is probably unfeasible, and then you think, well, type 3 is actually pretty crisp at the third level, so now we need... And it just goes on and on. And there are actually people working on type N fuzzy logic where they do just think whether it's possible to continue going uh, and gradually gets more fuzzy. Um, so as this picture kind of shows, um, the only way to really deal with type 2 fuzzy logic is to start discretizing it. Um, because the computation requirements are too big. Too big. When you've got 3D sets and you need to kind of get membership functions in all these sets, there's an operation called centroid, which is how you actually get the value out of this. Um, to do this on a completely continuous type 3 set, uh, type 2 set, this doesn't work. Was that a thumb or time? Cool. Oh, cool. <laughs> cool. Um, which just uh, the computation requirements are too huge. Um, so we have to start cutting up, which lowers our accuracy. So Really, type 2 fuzzy logic is kind of one huge research question. When you ask, how can you use this today, the answer is it's kind of an open research question. If you ask, why would you use it today, the answer is it's kind of an open research question. If you ask, how would you construct a fuzzy set, it's kind of an open research question. But there are people using it, and it does get used a lot. So robotics is actually one area where it is kind of very well defined. Um, there's a guy called Christian Wagner who has uh, developed a Java library called Juzzy, um, which... Uh, allows you to make type 2 fuzzy logic systems, and they are relatively computationally sane. Uh, he uses something called Z-slices, which is the cake. So he cuts it, and allows you to specify how much you want it cut uh, to make it computationally sensible. Um, so, in kind of summary, fuzzy logic is amazing. It doesn't work in the real world, because it doesn't measure vagueness. But with type 2 fuzzy logic, we can get there. But it's all very fuzzy, really. We don't know how to use it. But there is a way you can help, which is kind of why I want to do this talk today. We need more people writing real-world software that uses fuzzy logic and has examples online. Fuzzy logic is very much an engineering and research discipline. There's lots lots of people using it for years and years, but none of that code seems to be on GitHub or open source, and no one can get hold of it, and there's no libraries for it. There's these things called toolkits, which are mostly made for MATLAB and cost about $400 for a license. It's madness. So there are certain open source initiatives now trying to get this. So for example, there's a Haskell library for it called Huzzy, um, which I developed for my thesis. Um, jump in there, contribute, jump on Juzzy, put it on GitHub, contribute. Um, if you've got any knowledge of set theory or fuzzy logic at all, please come in and try and help us make this uh, moving forward research area, especially if you're very good with parallelism. Um, I hope that all made sense. I would love some questions. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. Before I leave the stage, are there any questions? Okay, guys, if you have any questions for Joe, we're taking them in sets of three, so please don't be shy with your questions, and we'll go from there. Okay, anyone at all? Don't be shy. Yes, we have okay, one. This light is here. kind of blinding me, but I can see. <laughs> um, so that talk was kind of... I didn't know how techy everyone would be, so don't feel afraid to ask techy questions. I have kind of gone for a lower level. Hi there. Yeah. Is, is there any um, limit to the, uh, well, if you do fuzzy to the power of n, you've mm -hmm. got fuzzy and then fuzzy mm -hmm. squared, what stop it, what's stopping you there? In principle, can't this just be extended, you know, however long? Yes, in principle it can, um, which is why uh, some people are working on this. This is the type n fuzzy logic, as I mentioned. Um, there's slight complications with how you start to represent the set operations. So, uh, for example, uh, conjunction, disjunction, uh, complement, etc., are all very well defined, and uh, people have discovered these for type 2 fuzzy logic. As you get to the higher fuzzy sets, there's some issue of how do we actually do these, and there's even more issue of how do we do these sanely. Um, so if you look at type 2 fuzzy logic now, essentially what you have to do is cut that into an infinite number of the type 1 sets, and then... Uh, so if we're doing disjunction, we take a type, we take two type two sets, cut them into an infinite number of type one sets, and then disjunction those. Obviously, it's not possible with the infinite, so we have to apply some level of discretization. So it's just thinking of the same way to do this, which is why some type two is starting to creep into usage now. Anything above type two isn't really; it's just theory. So there's nothing stopping you doing it. It's just mad. Cool. Okay. Does anyone else have a question here? Anyone at all? You can test cool. your maths chops. No? Cool, thank you. Oh, hang on, we got one over there, okay. 
have you got any examples of interesting software that you've seen using Fuji Lo Fuzzy Logic? For Type 1, Fuzzy Logic is everywhere. Um, again, washing machine cameras. A really cool one for Type 1 is actually, uh, which in itself is hard to explain because it involves fuzziness, is blurriness in cameras, so fo like cameras being out of focus. A lot of uh, auto-focusing in cameras actually uses Fuzzy Logic to determine whether an area of the image is out of focus or fuzzy. Um, so this brings it, this, that's a cool application. Uh, for Type 2, there is one really interesting one, which is, um, a lot, it's been used quite a lot in medical research. Um, so one of the cool ones is uh, kind of detecting whether an elderly person has fallen over. Um, so obviously that's inherently already a fuzzy problem because they might just be bending down to do their shoelace up. Um, so, but then you've also got uncertain measurements. So you don't know exactly what they're doing, so there's some uncertainty there, uh, and you don't know... You, don't, you have some delay with your data because you're trying to get real-time accelerometer data. Um, so there's two levels of uncertainty which kind of lends itself very well to Type 2 Fuzzy Logic. And they have actually got the system working. It, will, it can effectively recognize whether a person lowering to the ground is a fall or whether they're just doing it sensibly. Um, and there's a published paper on that somewhere as well. So um, that's quite a cool application. Cool. Does anyone want to be, have the honor of the final question? Anyone at all? No, I think oh, I would one know, oh, just one over there, yes. Um, does fuzzy logic have uh, a potential to cause problems if you decide to use fuzzy logic when you shouldn't use it? Yes. Um, so the issue of using fuzzy logic you shouldn't is very much one of whether you're dealing with uncertainty or vagueness. This is kind of why type 2 started being used, because a lot of people were using... Uh, type 1 to deal with uncertainty, but because of the fact that your membership functions are clearly and crisply defined, it's not uncertainty, it deals with its vagueness. Um, so if you use type 1 to model uncertainty, uh, it's kind of inherently dangerous because you're not actually dealing with the uncertainty, it's an accurate model, which is where you need to start thinking about using type 2, because type 2 can deal with uncertainty, if that made any sense. The difference between vagueness and uncertainty is kind of an odd concept. But. Okay, uh, oh, oh just before we're about to finish, yes, just go to, I believe his name is Dan. So, uh, a lot of the stuff you're talking about with the fuzzy logic about being able to decide, say, for a washing machine, what temperature it should set things at, mm -hmm. how does that sort of impact, with, say, uh, for, if I was trying to build something like that, I'd look at, like, constraint programming. Mm -hmm. So, how does the fuzzy logic stuff... Okay, yeah, so, it's essentially... It's kind of like constructing an expert system. Um, it's essentially a nice way of packaging up. So you get a fuzzy logic controller that basically takes in some input value that is a crisp value, so say temperature or uh, weight of the load in the washing machine. Um, you have a base of rules, so these are uh, if-then rules of the form of like you've got a fuzzy set and a fuzzy value on the right, and that's the consequent. So you'd use it in places you'd want to use an expert system. So you've got a knowledge base built up um, basic of like if-then rules. Uh, you take some value, you apply it to these rules, and you get an answer out that kind of tells you how to, um, that tells you what the result is from those rules. Um, versus constraint programming, there's a lot of different solutions, same thing. So on the YouTube video, uh, someone pointed out that why couldn't you just do this with a load of conditionals? And the answer is you can. It's just, it's a nicer model. So if you've got a large database of rules, if you want to change something, you don't have to change all the individual data, you just update your membership function. So it's kind of just good software programming practice, really. You've got everything compacted in different areas, and you can change different things. I'm not sure if that answered the question at all. Probably didn't. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. <laughs> cool. OK. Um, oh, we just have one more question now. Wow, they keep coming out now. Helpful. Sorry, I was just thinking, when you were talking about in the washing machine, when you said you might have a kind of membership value of 0.65 for too cold, mm -hmm and then obviously your action is heat it up. How do you then decide which action to take? So you can't run 0.65 of a heating action. You've got to either run it or not. Yeah, so um, what you actually have on the uh, consequence side of the rule, so in the action, is another fuzzy set. So we would have a fuzzy set, for example, uh, to increase the flow of hot water. Um, and what then happens is the fuzzy set from the consequence of so 0.65, that is used to uh, apply some action to the change set. So there's kind of two actions that are universally used. It's either scale or uh, truncate. So we might decide to multiply all values along that graph by 0.65. We might just cut it off at 0.65. And then you end up, the actual output from that rule is in itself a fuzzy set. 
and this is where we need to apply defalsification, um, which is usually something called the centroid algorithm, which basically takes the kind of center of gravity of the set. Um, and that will then be the value we apply to use the action. So getting the actual output value as a value you can use is a step called defalsification, basically. Cool. Okay, uh, guys, uh, Joe is the last person in uh, this stage speaking, so please put your hands together for him. Thank you very much for coming.